Sanch, we're ready. You didn't, I didn't hear the signal, but we're ready. All right. Can everyone hear me online as well? All right. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to the first colloquium of spring. So today we have the pleasure of having Professor Prochaska from UC Santa Cruz joining us and talking about probing the universe with fast radio bursts. A little bit about him. Um, he is master of many things. Uh, he started working on gas around galaxies and distant universe. And uh, he got his PhD from UC San Diego in 1998. Then he took the Carnegie and Hubble Fellowship to Carnegie Observatories where he was there for three years. And then he moved to UC Santa Cruz as a faculty and he has been there since. He has been working on a wide range of things and, and is an expert on all those things. He has worked on, of course, fast radio bursts, gas around galaxies, damp line and alpha systems, many other things, um, including uh, some of the other things that he might be talking about today. But recently, he won the Pivot Fellowship from the Simons Foundation to spend a year in UC San Diego studying oceanography. So. If you're not, um, if you're interested in those kinds of topics, also you can talk to him later on after the after the colloquium. All right. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Xavier Prochaska to talk about fast radio bursts. Thanks, Sanch. Thanks, everyone, for coming. No pause soon. And yes, today's presentation will be on fast radio bursts (FRBs). Uh, I presume most, if not all of you, are not experts in FRBs, so this is, talk is geared to introduce you to the topic, give you a sense of what they are, at least from an observational standpoint, probably not so much from the theoretical, because that remains an open mystery, an enigma, and describe why I am so excited about using them to probe the universe. That's the, uh, the outline today. Most of the logos here are of those of teams across the planet who are detecting fast radio bursts with radio telescopes. You'll see a few in a slide to come. The team that I'm most involved in is the one in the middle. We call ourselves Fast and Fortunate or FRB follow-up. We take advantage of these other teams who are providing or detecting FRBs uh, with radio facilities and do a lot of the other uh, follow-up activities with optical, infrared, x-ray, whatever, whatever telescope that may be involved. The team is modest in size. I want to introduce them to you. There's two slides of them. Here's uh, the first slide. Um, the leadership are the folks towards the bottom, uh, Regina Jorgensen, Nicholas Tejos, and Wenfei Fong, and myself, are kind of the, the older crowd involved uh, in this activity. The rest are a range of postdocs and undergraduates and postbacs and graduate students, um, mainly from the United States, but we are a bit international. I'm going to highlight the work of two of these uh, astronomers today, in particular, Alexandra Monnings. You'll see her work towards the end of the talk and a bit of Sunil's as we go. And yet one more student to highlight, at least as far as today's presentation, Jay Baptista, who's an undergraduate at Yale applying to for grad school. Uh, give him an eye if he's applied here. I'm not sure if he, if he did for ASU or not. That's our team. As I said, we uh, spend most of our activity uh, pursuing fast radio bursts and largely uh, to do new measurements of the universe, uh, novel measurements, unlock uh, secrets that we were previously unable to uh, access with our traditional techniques. So I'm gonna, the next 10 slides or so, I'm gonna introduce you to fast radio bursts. At the heart of fast radio bursts are the dispersion measure. Uh, I'm gonna use the acronym DM to define them. And uh, this video that one of the teams generated inter will introduce you to the, turn, the, the notion of dispersion and the dispersion measure. And the concept is uh, that as a pulse of radiation, here radio waves primarily, travel through the universe, if they uh, intercept plasma ionized gas between us and the source, uh, as electromagnetism, as photons travel through a plasma, the, the speed of light is retarded, and the photons that have longer wavelengths 
uh, the redder light, uh, the speed of light is retarded larger. It goes like frequency squared, such that you get a dispersion in the arrival time of the, pho of the photons from the pulse uh, as recorded in the, the radio telescope today. Uh, I'll pause the movie there, but that's dispersion. Okay, it's the spreading out in time of a pulse of radiation uh, as it traverses plasma across the universe. Fast radio bursts are detected with radio telescopes. That's not a surprise given the name. Um, the first one recorded and published came from this telescope. This is the Parkes Telescope in Australia. It's a beautiful 1950s circa facility, um, a single dish. And uh, as you'll see uh, now, pretty much every radio telescope on the planet is involved uh, in trying to detect these interesting signals. Uh, the next several slides are going to introduce to you the, the variety of information we gain from uh, these pulses of radiation, these FRBs. Here is about as glorious of an image of an FRB as you get. For astronomy, this is perhaps all, not all that brilliant uh, for those of us that like staring at galaxies or planets or stars. Uh, but here you go. There's the FRB <laughs> in its glory. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the arrival time um, of the pulse of radiation here in seconds, and on the y-axis, the frequency, and you're seeing that dispersion again. You're seeing that the photons with the shorter frequencies, the lower frequencies, have arrived almost a second after uh, the photons with uh, the highest frequencies within this band pass. And that sweep is the characteristic signal of a fast radio burst, and so that's the image of it of an FRB. As I mentioned, the, one of the defining characteristics, perhaps the defining characteristic of an FRB is this dispersion measure, DM, which the movie cartoon for you. Again, here's an FRB, image of an FRB. This is the first one published and one of the first ones ever recorded. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Duncan Lorimer, the lead author, uh, who discovered it in this, with the Parkes Telescope, discovered it largely serendipitously. Uh, this is not a common story in astronomy, but it's not the only uh, incident of a pretty remarkable serendipitous discovery. He was searching for a pulsar-like phenomenon called R-rats. What they are is not important, but looking for something like a pulsar towards the Magellanic Clouds. And as the story goes, he changed his software to search for these phenomena, these R-rats, and searched for sources that would have a dispersion measure, a DM, much too large for uh, where you know what he was trying to discover. The DM that he did, this FRB, this DM that he did uh, record was far too large for anything that would come from the Magellanic Clouds. And I'll explain that in a moment. So the sweep, as I said, is due to the dispersion of the electromagnetic radiation uh, by a plasma. That's straightforward ENM. The arrival time goes like frequency, the inverse square of the frequency. And it's also scaled by this dispersion measure, how much material you traverse through. Uh, dispersion measure has got a goofy astronomy unit associated with it that's parsecs per cubic centimeter. Um, there are a number of folks in the crowd that measure column densities for some of their science. This is a column density recast in a funny parsec per cubic centimeter uh, unit. Formally, this is the equation that defines the dispersion measure. It's the path integral of the number of electrons that the photons traverse through. Straight and simple. Path integral of the electron density. If you travel to cosmological distances, then you have to introduce one factor of the scale factor, this one plus z here in the denominator. But it's a simple integral quantity uh, that records the number of electrons that the photons have traversed through, and it's entirely determined by the uh, this shape of the sweep through the frequency time space. So for this event, now named gloriously FRB 20010724, we typically refer to it as Lorimer burst, but that's the date that it was recorded with the Parkes telescope. This dispersion measure has a value of 375 okay, parsecs per cubic centimeter. And that was very exciting to uh, the scientists here that recorded the event and eventually published it. Because they appreciated that 375 number was far too large, as I mentioned, for any source towards the Magellanic Clouds. And let me describe that to you in some detail here. This uh, image is showing the dispersion measure estimated across the sky, the, the full sky, uh, associated with gas in our galaxy, in the Milky Way. So we have 
uh, model, but it's a, an empirically based model, uh, where the data here is from pulsars. So we have pulsars distributed throughout the Milky Way. Those pulsars each have a dispersion measure associated with them, same dispersion measure that I just described. And people have built, using those data of pulse, from pulsars, built models for how electrons are distributed in the Milky Way. And that leads to this map, which then is the dispersion measure from any random location. You can see uh, an enhanced, you know, much higher values along the plane of the galaxy, the plane here, the disk, the disk of the galaxy is oriented along uh, the line of the equator of this, of this globe, if you will. Um, and then as you move off the plane of the Milky Way, the dispersion measure creeps down to values of around a few tens of units, 10 and 30 or so. Well, the event that I showed you in the previous slide located towards the Magellanic Clouds is here on, uh, on, our, on our globe. Um, and clearly the 375 number far exceeds uh, any estimate that we would associate with the Milky Way. It also far exceeds any estimate you would place uh, within the Magellanic Clouds as well. And so it was strong evidence that this source that they had detected was extragalactic and that we were recording additional electrons from gas beyond the Milky Way, beyond the Magellanic Clouds, even far beyond any of our nearby galaxies, so an extragalactic origin. I'll come back to that. Some of the other signals or the other measurements we make of FRBs from the observational perspective is the localization. So where the position on the sky. From the Parkes telescope and Parkes led the discovery of the first 10, 20 or so FRBs, that single dish telescope. Um, the localization is poor. It's, uh, it was on the order of the size of this, this image here, which is about 10 arc minutes on a side. 10 arc minutes for some folks is a pretty precise localization. It's precise for a gravitational wave events, uh, if that interests you. But for optical astronomy, of course, 10 arc minutes is a huge uh, patch of the sky. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies within it. Uh, it's impossible to associate a source like this with any distant object, distant, distant galaxy. However, some FRBs repeat. Uh, and one was known, first determined to repeat in about 2015. And a couple of years later, uh, that enabled astronomers to point an interferometer at source and detect it and localize it to sub arc second. And when they did, uh, they realized that it came from a pretty low mass, but not so distant galaxy, redshift 0.1. For those of you that uh, are familiar with redshifts, that's, not, that's somewhat of the local universe, but still clearly well beyond uh, the Milky Way. And then a couple of years later, uh, a new system turned on uh, an interferometer. This is from the ASCAP telescope, which I'll show uh, a bit later, um, that could both detect and localize the FRBs in one go. And here's the first example uh, from that system with the black circle indicating the localization, the position on the sky uh, of the FRB event. And again, associating it to a, a distant galaxy. Here, this one, I think it shift about 0.4. I will hopefully by the end of the talk uh, speak a bit about rotation measure. This is another measurement one can make from a pulse of radio uh, emission. Here the concept, again, electromagnetism, again, uh, photons traversing through a plasma, but this plasma is magnetized. And if there's uh, a magnetic field uh, oriented along the, the line of sight, then the polarization angle of the radiation is rotated. And that rotation also depends on frequency. Here's a plot of that. There's the rotation angle. Here's frequency. And there's a slight rotate, a slight modification in the polarization angle as a function of frequency. That's what's referred to as the rotation measure. And it's valuable, valuable in the sense that uh, not only is it sensitive to the amount of plasma it traverses through, like the dispersion measure, but also the, uh, the magnetic field oriented along the line of sight. So this is a a distinct way to make an inference on the strength of the magnetic field within that plasma. Very briefly, there's additional signals, uh, a light curve in, in transient speak, uh, the duration of the pulse, this width of the pulse. These are very, can be very short, even uh, tens of nanoseconds. This pulse is less than 40 uh, microseconds uh, in width there. That's what was the, uh, the temporal resolution of the, uh, of the radio facility. That gives you access to uh, constraints on the density of the gas. I won't talk about that today. Come to the talk tomorrow if you're interested in, in that type of science. Um, and then putting it all together uh, for an individual event, a dispersion measure, which really defines the FRB 
its position on the sky, which uh, and for, for the talk purpose of this talk in particular, let, let's associate this the event to a galaxy and measure its redshift, its distance. The rotation measure, accessing the magnetic field, additional energetics, uh, the scattering uh, that I briefly mentioned. And again, if we associate to a host, then we have access to the galaxy that uh, this thing, uh, the source arose within. Any questions there? That's an observational, a brief, somewhat quick observational introduction to fast radio bursts for the audience. Yeah, if you have any questions, um, I'll take. Um, I think there is a question online. Yeah, so um, let me, there's two questions online. And if you could go back to the first graph, the one with, well, I guess it's this one. Um, Samantha was asking uh, just what do FRB graphs tell a person looking at it? So I think she's just looking for a little further explanation. You still have your mic? Okay. It's physics there, but it's not uh, part of the, you know, it's not something that you would measure from the source. It's just the aspect of the astrophysics. But the total delay time is sensitive to the dispersion measure. So from this sweep, we measure directly the dispersion measure. You get one number out of that data. And here there's quite a bit of signal noise. You measure that number extremely precisely. You know, I've, I've put one decimal place. There's probably two decimal places involved in that measurement. Other question? There's one more here, and I'm not sure which um, slide they're referring to, but what does the higher electron density at minus 270 degrees represent? Ah, the, yes. The oval-shaped structure. I understand. So these uh, yeah, circles, mobiles, whatever, within the plane are uh, supernova remnants in H2 regions nearby, and since they're large angular size on the sky. That's a good question. Thank you. Great. That's all, that's all online for now. So uh, I will not speak much today or hardly, oh, okay. Observationally now uh, here in 2023, uh, we, this whole field really started with the Parkes telescope uh, in 2007. Now, as I mentioned, nearly every radio telescope worth its salt is uh, trying to detect FRBs, most commensally. That is, the telescope may be doing other science, directed science, um, but then the back end, there's an additional system in the computational that is sifting through the signal in real time, looking for that sweep, and if it's detected, saving it to the hard drive so that we can analyze it further. What generates FRBs? Uh, short answer, I don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, there's tens of theories uh, in the literature um, proposed to generate pulses, energetic, very energetic pulses of radio emission for um, tens of microseconds, even nanoseconds timescales. Uh, one of the leading prevailing models is a magnetar. That's some artist's conception of a magnetar, a very uh, highly magnetized neutron star. Um, this is a, a nice environment for accelerating uh, charged particles, which can then lead to a coherently lead to a fast radio burst emission. But today, uh, this remains an open and um, part of the uh, fun of pursuing these observations. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to chat more, a bit more. But uh, afterwards, but it's these days uh, an open source of uh, research. Instead, I'm going to focus on how I'm going to use those signals, how we use those signals I just described to probe the universe uh, in a few different ways. And I'm going to start in the largest scales, the cosmic web. This is a visualization of what we call the cosmic web, our universe. Um, this is outputs from a computer simulation. We unfortunately cannot make beautiful images of the uh, universe like this with real data. Um, this is the, almost all the material here is effectively unviewable or unseeable directly. So we uh, infer its presence from other techniques, including fast radio bursts. The, uh, the genesis of my interest in fast radio bursts comes from uh, a standing problem that I was attacking for mm, 20 years, certainly starting from that my time at the Carnegie Observatories as a postdoc. And the story goes like this, the motivation goes like this. First and foremost, um, there, uh, the baryon mass density of the universe is known. So we use omega b here, 
refer to the omega, the mass density of the universe in baryons, ordinary matter, hydrogen, helium, periodic table. That number is known cosmologically. In fact, it's, I think it's the most precisely of all cosmological parameters known or measured. And the reason is because of two, uh, we have two complementary uh, experiments that we can use to establish that number. And they're being highlighted here. The blue uh, refers to measurements of deuterium, the isotope of hydrogen, which we measure from quasar absorption line analysis. A few experts in the crowd on that. Uh, one of the things one can measure from spectra of quasars is the di deuterium uh, isotopic abundance relative to hydrogen, total hydrogen. Coupling that measurement with theories of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, we place a constraint on omega baryon, the x-axis here, as a function of the number of effective neutrino species, which we know to be about three, a little bit higher than three, um, from particle physics. That's one measurement using quasar spectra. The other is the gray region, uh, and that comes from analysis of the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. Uh, increase, the number of the mass density of baryons affects the oscillations of the photons of the CMB, which we measure very precisely, and thereby uh, get an indirect or largely direct measurement of the baryon mass density. Those two agree to, to a few percent level, um, which is why I assert this is one of the best known cosmological parameters of the universe of, by, that we've measured. So omega BH squared is known. And it's been known, it's been, the first measurements are almost two decades, actually a bit more than two decades old. This is a modern version, but still by the end of the 1990s, we had established pretty well uh, this value that is about four and a half percent of the mass energy budget of the universe is in baryons. All right, well, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, in a paper published in 1998, Masataka Fukugita-san uh, pointed out, uh, or did a complementary analysis of counting up the baryons in today's universe. Um, come back here for a moment. These measurements, or these analyses, rely on astrophysics from the very early universe. This is about 10 minutes after the Big Bang. This is 300,000 years after the Big Bang when the CMB was released. So these are rather early measurement observations. Masataka uh, said, okay, if we know how many baryons are out in the universe from these data, we should be able to observe them in our nearby universe. So off he went to do that uh, accounting, that census of gas baryons in the, in the present day. He counted up the mass density in stars, so galaxies, using galaxy surveys at the time were reasonably good. He counted up the atomic gas using 21 centimeter surveys of galaxies, H1. He counted up the molecular gas using carbon monoxide, CO, which is the tracer of molecular gas, H2, uh, in the galaxies of our universe. And he counted up the hot phase uh, from X-ray observations of galaxy clusters, large um, mass and, and hot ionized baryons within galaxy clusters. And pointed out that the wedges uh, that he, you know, of the complete pi that he was searching for um, amounted to less than half of all the baryons expected. Say it again, he had introduced this Pac-Man, goofy looking Pac-Man, if you will, of missing baryons in our universe. Um, and I've given public talks over the last 20 years where I've introduced the first slide and said, we know as cosmologists, we know how many baryons are in the universe. And yet we can't find more than half of them. And that became known as the missing baryons problem. And it set uh, a number of astronomers, some of whom I think are in the room, including myself, to go in search of this missing material, uh, presumed to be in a pretty highly ionized, relatively warm phase that we sometimes refer to as the WIM. So we used any and every, at least I did, uh, observational facility at our disposal, x-ray facilities, UV facilities, ground-based optical facilities to search for these missing baryons. And while a lot of, I'd say, excellent science was done, uh, we were unable to identify that missing half uh, directly. And that's unfortunate or whatever, that was, uh, that stymied us for about 20 years. Um, but it became clear, at least to me, when uh, the first fast radio burst was detected, that we might have a completely new opportunity to detect that gas. And it, harkens back to this dispersion measure and the fact that uh, we have the path integral of all the material, all the ionized gas between us 
and the source uh, in, encoded in this dispersion measure. So to uh, dig in a little bit deeper on that concept, here's our cosmic web. We have gas predominantly ionized throughout the universe. Some of it is in low density regions. We refer to it as the intergalactic medium, the gas between galaxies. Some of it is associated with galaxies. It's surrounding the galaxies. It's again, hot, still highly ionized, but close and uh, in a denser phase uh, in the surrounding regions of galaxies, sometimes referred to the, the CGM. Altogether, that's the cosmic web. And we have a prediction from cosmology for the dispersion measure of that cosmic web. It's that same equation you've seen, the path integral of electron density, where I've now replaced ds with the full cosmological terms. Uh, omega m is the mass density in matter. Omega lambda is the dark energy component. H naught's Hubble's constant. The rest is redshift. But at the heart of it is really just the electron density of the universe, so the baryon, with electrons being a tracer for the baryon. And so that you know, directly traces omega b, this quantity that we were able to observe in the early universe from BBN and CMB. Uh, we now want to go and repeat this experiment in the local universe and search for the baryons using this dispersion measure. Here's an evaluation of that equation as a function of redshift. So the average cosmic dispersion, the dispersion measure from the cosmic web, our universe, as a function of the distance to the source. Straightforward calculation from cosmology. That's the mean relation. There is a dispersion about the mean predicted. This is a model. The black line straight cosmology, the evaluation of that equation. The gray band is a, uh, a prediction, a model based prediction uh, of the dispersion about that mean. And the, physically, the concept is as a sight line traverses through this cosmic web, some sight lines will go through regions that are, have higher densities uh, and hence higher dispersion measures. Some regions, some sight lines which can traverse through across the universe, hardly intersecting or intersecting much less gas. And so you get a physical scatter about the mean due to uh, structure in the universe. And this gray band gives you a sense of a prediction for that uh, dispersion or that scatter about the mean. So this is the prediction that we want to test with the fast radio bursts. All we need now are the FRBs with dispersion measures and the corresponding redshifts. And the game changer in this, uh, for this science uh, was the ASCAP telescope pictured here in the background. That's an interferometer of 36 dishes in Western Australia. It's one of the precursors for the square kilometer array. And Keith Bannister led a, leads a project called CRAFT which is a computational backend for the ASCAP telescope searching for FRBs. Um, and as I showed in one of the earlier slides, this facility can both detect and localize them to sub arc second precision uh, all in one go. Um, it's an amazing uh, technical feat in itself. The data rate of ASCAP, I'm told, equates to about one tenth of all the internet traffic on Earth. That's the data rate that. He, the, the back end called craft is sifting through, looking for that sweep, those uh, scanning for those sweeps and detecting FRBs and saving of order one second of the day of that data flow to the hard drive so we can analyze it in depth. It works, uh, it detects FRBs, they get well localized. The red dot, which you put, may not even be able to see from the back of the room is one of, is actually the first FRB detected with the system. Uh, it lands on a galaxy. We developed the framework to associate the FRBs to galaxies in the sky. Happy to talk more about that if you're interested. But in cases like this, where it's really, it's really unambiguous, we have then the, uh, by the follow up activities that our team does, we can access the redshift of that source. And that's the other half uh, of the piece of the puzzle to uh, search for these missing variants, the redshift. Uh, I wish to. Uh, go dig in a little bit deeper on the dispersion measure. Um, I often refer to it as a, as a blessing and a curse. The blessing here is that it's, it, it gives us access to all the electrons in the universe, uh, the missing baryons. The curse is that it gives us, that it's sensitive to all the baryons or all the electrons along the sight line. Um, for the science that I am focusing on here, uh, I've been emphasizing the cosmic web that is 
measuring the, bar uh, the gas the material within our universe on large scales. But it, when we detect an FRB, that, that those photons will travel through gas in the galaxy that hosted it. Those photons will travel through uh, our Milky Way halo, which uh, extends out to say over 100 kiloparsecs. That those photons will travel through the interstellar medium of our galaxy. So there's additional uh, electrons contributing to that signal, which we need to account for in the analysis, and we do. But I want to be clear, it's not as simple as just the DMFRB that we record. We need to account for additional components between us and the signal. Uh, refer to the cosmic component as DM cosmic. This is the next, the next figure or two, or even this equation. So the observed quantity is the one in blue. As I said, that's very precisely measured. There's no uncertainty, at least in the analysis. It's irrelevant uncertainty. Uh, the challenge is, is accounting for the additional contributions to that signal from components we're not interested in for this uh, measurement. The gas in our Milky Way, as I said, we've built a pretty robust model for the interstellar medium of our galaxy using pulsar data. So that one's actually pretty well checked off. It's these other components, the halo of our galaxy. Uh, there's new results on that um, that predate this that are still improving uh, our inference of the purple, the desired quantity, cosmic dispersion measure. And then the host galaxy, the galaxy that hosts the effort. That's, that's playing a role as well. For the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, estimates that assume a 50 contribution from the host and the halo of our galaxy. Um, but the full analysis allows for those to be uh, unknown and fitted for quantities. So this was the target, uh, the, the mean dispersion measure leisure, DM cosmic uh, dispersion versus redshift uh, with some expected intrinsic uh, scatter about the mean. And this was the first uh, set of uh, five high quality past all of our selection criteria events. Lo and behold, uh, they land uh, right along the dispersion measure as predicted from our cosmology and from the omega baryon uh, that we've measured from the CMB in the Big Bang nucleus synthesis. And when I presented this work, we now recall referred to it as a McCore relation. JP McCore was uh, one of the also one of the scientific leaders of the Kraft collaboration. He wrote the paper, or led the paper. Um, he had he passed away about a week after its publication. We've now referred to this DMZ correlation as a McCore relation in his honor. Um, and when I presented these results to Masataka. Fukugita, uh, he agreed uh, we had detected the missing baryons that he had pointed out in, in 1998, here roughly uh, 22 years later. And he was willing to retire, and he has retired uh, with not quite a smile on his face, but <laughs> something akin to it. Okay, so uh, the uh, analysis since 2020 has evolved. We've, uh, we've been, uh, you'll see additional data in the next slide. Uh, we have uh, and built upon the analysis as well, which I'll describe in a bit more detail. Uh, I'm going to combine the contribution from the cosmic web and the host galaxy into something I'll refer to as DMEG. So I just want to get that terminology. DMEG for extragalactic. So all the electrons beyond our galaxy and its, its local group are going to be wrapped up into the extragalactic component, which we can estimate uh, quite well from the FRB measurement we make, subtracting off our best estimates for the Milky Way. The DMEG, here are uh, 16, maybe 18, 17 uh, measurements of that quantity from FRBs. The redshifts, we've now detected one uh, out beyond a redshift of one. And uh, the best uh, estimate of the cosmic dispersion and the host contribution combined, uh, which is uh, given by the black line. And while well, the first five, yeah, uh, similar to the first five lying, lying well uh, on the correlation, so too uh, do we see that today in the next 16, or the full 16 sample we have now. Um, again, this scatter about the, the mean relations expected, uh, physical, it's not measurement uncertainty, it's, it's structure in the universe and it's uh, distributions of gas within the host galaxy itself. So the analysis proceeds these days as described here. This is a bit of a complicated plot. The, the x-axis remains the redshift, the y-axis remains this extragalactic EM which is the cosmic plus host contribution. The colored uh, region uh, is a model of uh, the probability distribution of in this space of FRBs, the redshifts and the dispersion measure. And to generate that model, uh, we do forward modeling, forward model analysis that includes uh, estimations of the host dispersion measure, uh, 
uh, accounts for the FRB energetics. Uh, we are using telescopes. These have finite sensitivity. And one has to account for the finite sensitivity in the beam uh, of the radio facilities. One has to model as well the other properties of the FRB, their widths and their scatter and the scattering that ensues on them. Um, Hubble's parameter enters, which is great. We get a handle, uh, a constraint on Hubble's parameter. Um, and so too does the intrinsic scatter uh, in the cosmic quantity that I emphasize as being due to uh, variation and variations in uh, clustering within the cosmic web. So all that uh, enters the modeling today. Um, I'm going to skip two slides on Hubble's constant. If you're excited by Hubble's constant, be aware one can use fast radio bursts to constrain it. It's a low redshift universe estimation, which competes with what you might infer from the CMB. But suffice it to say, uh, that science exists, and I'm happy to speak on it in the Q&A if you want to come back to it. But instead, I want to focus on uh, another um, aspect of the analysis, which is constraining galaxy feedback. Um, we have evidence from observation, which is what you see on the left, that galaxies can push gas uh, around, ga gas from within and push it without, from beyond. We colloquially refer to this as galaxy feedback. Uh, it can be associated with N a number of processes, supernovae exploding, quasars uh, shining very brightly uh, are to radio jets. It's kind of a colloquial term for any process that uh, can push around gas, dust, and metals uh, from uh, a galaxy to beyond it. It's a very messy astrophysical process, clearly. All those scenarios that I described, each of them are uh, difficult to model, very, you might say, impossible from first principles, but we try. And people inject these models into galaxy formation scenarios. That's what the, the right-hand plot is showing. And it's two predictions from two different uh, named galaxy formation scenarios, fire and TNG, if you know such scenarios. And what's predicted here is the fraction of variants that are retained by the galaxy uh, as they turn on processes of galaxy feedback, um, whether it be stars exploding, AGN uh, illuminating, shoving gas around, and so forth. And you can see uh, that there are wildly dis differing, wildly, there's order two or a few differing predictions for how effective galaxies can push gas outside of their galaxies. Um, in the fire simulations, nearly all the mass is retained within galaxies like our own, like the Milky Way, where it's within this TNG scenario, they predict of order half uh, of the material has been ejected out into the universe around. It, these, both of these simulations produce galaxies that look realistic. Okay, so while they both introduce galaxy feedback scenarios or prescriptions to produce galaxies and make relatively realist, realistic galaxies. They have rather wildly different predictions on how effective the, uh, those feedback processes are at shoving gas around them. And we are now in the process of generating, using FRBs to constrain models like this. Let me say a few words on that. So um, the concept uh, probing the cosmic web Still, but now uh, not just the mean relation, which is which I focused on uh, on the previous slides, but the scatter about that mean. Uh, I won't dwell on the equations, but we um, expect the scatter to uh, decrease with source distance with redshift, and that's because the longer you travel through the universe, the more less sense well, the more the inhomogeneities average out. So if you go to larger distance then you will intersect structures, uh, more and more structures, and hence uh, be beaten down by uh, RMS uh, of, the, of, the, of the structure. But F uh, is an unknown scaling of that, um, of that uh, scatter, and it's sensitive to uh, the galaxy formation uh, prescriptions that one puts into uh, their simulations. I'll skip over the details, but I can come back to the equation. Here's an illustration of that. So, in models where you uh, increase galaxy feedback, that's actually to the right here, you would expect all of the measurements of the cosmic web, dispersion measure of the cosmic web to be close to the average. And so there'd be a delta function. If I let F go all the way down to zero, you'd see a delta function right at uh, one. To the extent that you let galaxy, that you 
galaxies retain their baryons, if they don't shove them out, that the galaxy feedback is weak, then you get distributions that look like this, where you have a, a wide distribution, a wide scatter uh, in the dispersion. We're sensitive to that in the data. Um, how sensitive? Well, this is a predictive the forecast. Um, you, you'll see a publication with real data soon, not as precise. But within the next uh, year, uh, we anticipate having of order 100 FRBs to perform the experiment and constraining this F value to of order 20%. Uh, hence, I've been going around communicating to my colleagues who run galaxy formation scenarios that now is the time um, to calculate from your scenarios what is your prediction for F. Um, because within the year we'll have of order 20% and you'll know rather uh, quickly whether or not your prescription for galaxy formation feedback uh, is consistent or ruled out. Tomorrow I'll talk about probing individual galactic halos with FRBs. So if you're interested in that topic, I think it's 1030 second floor. Come on by. Um, this is just an advertisement of that. Uh, I will spend the remainder of the time on uh, using FRBs to uh, uncover aspects of the interstellar medium of normal galaxies. Here are the normal galaxies are the galaxies hosting FRBs. We call them FRB hosts. Here are 20 uh, galaxies that ho have hosted an FRB. The FRBs are the localizations, are the little circles. Um, I think you can even see from the back, most of these are at redshift less than a half. Uh, there's one example, as I said, of redshift one. They're normal, ordinary galaxies. If you're not a galaxy expert, except that these are pretty boring, um, run-of-the-mill galaxies. The one aspect of them that distinguishes them from a truly, a really random population is that almost all of them are star forming or show evidence of star formation. None of them are quiescent, as you would say. None of them are dead galaxies, totally dead galaxies. But otherwise, they're pretty run-of-the-mill uh, star forming galaxies. That's the population we are playing with. Um, and we're going to use the signal, and I'll focus on one aspect of the signal, to make inferences about the interstellar medium, the gas within uh, the gas and related material within the galaxies. Here's a zoom in on one of those hosts. Uh, this FRB appears to have uh, occurred either within the spiral arm or near the spiral arm of this star forming galaxy. And with FRBs, we have this kind of random perspective into the ISM of a normal population uh, at low redshift. There are a few things of the interstellar medium we can gain access to, uh, density of the gas, total amount of gas. I'm gonna focus on the project led by Alexander Mannings here, which looks at the magnetic field strength, something we rarely have access to. That's kind of a unique, almost unique aspect of FRBs. Um, so rotation measure, I introduced this, but let me remind you, that's the rotation of the polarization angle uh, due to the electromagnetic, magnetic radiation propagating through this ionized plasma. If there's a magnetic field oriented along the sight line, rotation measure. Here are the nine galaxies uh, of this first publication. This kind of uh, introduction of using FRBs in this, in this manner. Um, here's one of the galaxies. Here's the population stellar mass and star formation rate. This is just showing in gray, kind of a random population of galaxies and colored points are the, uh, the hosts of the FRBs. And you're to appreciate they are drawn largely from the star forming population, which is this up here. Very few, really none within the really quiescent dead galaxies, a couple within this kind of inner region, inner, in between region we call the Green Valley. The normal galaxies with a pretty wide range of stellar masses. The Milky Way for context is uh, around 10 to the 10 solar masses. So galaxies a fair bit less massive than, the than our own galaxy and a few that are uh, more massive. What are the rotation measures? Uh, how do they scale with redshift? I showed you a series of plots that the dispersion measure increases with redshift. That was, we now call them a correlation. That's not the case for the rotation measure. Um, these have been corrected for the Milky Way. The Milky Way contributes to the signal of order 10 units. Uh, and so we have a model for that that we can subtract off. No correlation, none expected. We don't, uh, we did not expect the intergalactic cosmic web to be highly magnetized to level to show a strong signal with redshift distance. Um, and indeed it does not. So the absence of correlation implies the rotation measure contribution from the cosmic web is small as expected. 
Uh, and that means that the majority of the signal, once we subtract out the Milky Way, uh, must be coming from the host galaxy. And so we just invert that equation and have an estimate for the rotation measure in those uh, nine galaxies that we're studying. We've got secondary evidence in support of that, um, both a correlation between this RM host estimation with the, or an independent estimation of the dispersion measure from the galaxy. We expect those two to correlate if <laughs> the magnetic field that we're uh, exploring is coming from the host. And <clears throat> if magnetic field strength uh, varies with distance from the center of the galaxy, then it's normalized offset. Uh, you should see an anti-correlation. There's tentative evidence for that. These are small samples, but it's su supportive of the previous slide. Last scientific slide uh, of the talk, um, we have now uh, estimation of the rotation measure directly from the data, estimation of the dispersion measure from the host also from the data uh, that allows a uh, approximate estimation of the magnetic field within these galaxies. And here are those estimates. Um, the observed quantities are largely observed quantities on the axes and then uh, lines of constant magnetic field uh, in, the, in the various curves. The Milky Way for context is, the, is roughly in the local, in our environment near the sun, has a uh, magnetic field strength of about five microgauss. Uh, the majority of the data in these relatively ordinary galaxies uh, from FRBs lie near or below that line, um, consistent with uh, some uh, modest field uh, reversals within the galaxy, which is say from this first set of uh, data, we're finding magnetic field strengths by and large consistent with what we see in our own galaxy. Small sample, but it's now establishing uh, this new uh, avenue towards ass assessing the magnetic fields of, of distant galaxies. Um, for well, for many years, uh, we've appreciated that the magnetic pressure within our own interstellar medium is substantial. It's equivalent to the thermal pressure. Um, assessing that in distant galaxies uh, has been largely impossible. Uh, FRBs now provide an opportunity, and I know of at least fifty. Uh, additional uh, measurements in the works um, that you'll see within the next year or two. Let me conclude. Um, I've given you a, a brief overview of the observational uh, aspects of FRBs and how we are using them to leverage new insights into the universe on very large scales on the cosmic web and on smaller scales, the interstellar medium within galaxies. Uh, this field is just taking off right now. Um, the two curves show the cumulative number of published FRBs. The blue are uh, all FRBs. This spike uh, was the uh, initiation of a new experiment called CHIME, which is detecting hundreds, even almost a thousand per year. Um, that cutoff at 2020 is that's the last publication to date. I know they have of order 3,000. So that curve continues to rise off the page. <clears throat> the red are, are well localized, order arc second FRBs. Uh, this ramp up with due to that ASCAP telescope and the craft project on it. It too continues to rise and new experiments have just turned on that will continue it to have an exponential growth the next uh, several years uh, and beyond. So from the data perspective, this field has just started and continues to grow exponentially. You know, those are the uh, surveys driving that. Um, and no one's resting on their laurels. The craft surveys uh, built a whole new FBGA system to increase their sensitivity by almost an order of magnitude. CHIME is, out, is adding outriggers, which will increase their lo localization precision, or improve their localization precision so that they may uh, be detecting and localizing of order uh, an FRB a day, maybe more. Um, the DSA project just had a nice press splash release at the uh, AAS conference. Maybe some of you saw it. Uh, they've turned on and have now localized of order 30 FRBs. Um, and some of the science that's coming out, this was just released. This is from the CHIME project, a new constraint on the uh, mass and baryons within our own galactic halo. Um, won't go into any details, just slide by these. We've, as I said, we've detected now one FRB to redshift one. It's, it was actually quite bright, would have been easily detected uh, well beyond that. So we have optimism that we'll be probing uh, the gas uh, and the host galaxies out to redshift two and beyond. Uh, we already have dozens of FRBs um, in the host galaxy come with them, but this will become, you know, order 100, if not thousands uh, of galaxy science. So that some of the, you know, most of the results I showed today were of order 5, 10, 15 measurements. That'll quickly uh, increase by an order of magnitude. Uh, 
Uh, there are opportunities for lensing. I won't go into that. I move on to questions. Um, and I'll leave you with kind of a, a global slide that I often um, <clears throat> yeah, refer to uh, as far as where I think the field is at or is about to be at, the probable category. Uh, you've seen some of that today. The optimistic category may be measuring H naught to a few percent. Uh, and probably the overlap, overly optimistic category. I don't know if we'll probably get the percent for that. Measuring dark energy, I don't know. We'll see. Um, the field's new enough. Maybe it's still OK to be overly optimistic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some questions. Um, OK, I can like here. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't really tell from the postage stamps, but is there sort of more of a trend for the hosts being like face on or uh, edge on sparrows and, and the magnetic fields that you're estimating? At, basically, are those halo magnetic fields or something con constrained, uh, confined to the disk? Great question. So, first question on uh, inclination. There, in none in the sample you're seeing here, but in a subset, maybe the first half, we started thinking there was a pref preference for face on. Um, as, the, as the sample doubled, we've now done the analysis and they're consistent with random. So we saw something like your eye might have been picking on, but statistically it didn't hold up. Mm -hmm. As far as the influence, the, the halo, yes, the halo, can, uh, if there is a magnetized halo, and maybe there might well be, of the FRB, that can contribute to the signal. Um, my bet is a, yeah, that it's not uh, contributing much for what uh, you've seen in, in those nine, but I think it's something to consider. Um, if you come to the talk tomorrow, <laughs> I'll describe how we're uh, probing the magnetic fields of in galaxies that intervene uh, in a similar fashion. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any other from the floor here? Here's one right there. So I'll get this one if you get that one. Who was it? Jackie. Uh, for a given typical GRB, uh, what contributes more to the dispersion measure between uh, the electrons in the cosmic wave, like between galaxies and the electrons associated with uh, galaxies and its surrounding? Right. I, I'll repeat the question, so make sure I understood it, which is uh, in terms of the cosmic dispersion measure, which drives this equation. Um, how much of the uh, material is associated with the intergalactic mean? Is... The IGM, the gas in between galaxies, the more diffuse material, over densities of order unity or below. And how much of the material is associated with the gas uh, close into galaxies, what we call CGM or galactic halo. Um, short answer, we don't know. OK, so the. Emphasis of doing this project, what I was referring to as F, this feedback parameter, is to assess that. Okay, so to the and it, so the reason it's largely unknown is because again, this uh, phenomenon, whatever you call processes of galaxy feedback, have the you know will push gas beyond the halos, can push gas beyond the halos, and the extent that they do affects the answer to your question. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And if you want to know more on that topic, come to, I will go into it in a bit more depth than that tomorrow as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll bite. Um, what <laughs> was the, uh, what were your conclusions about the Hubble constant ah, so far? Sure. Um, just two quick slides on them. Well, two slides on that. Maybe I should just stick to one. Uh, I introduced this as the, as a forward model, the color curve, so the probability distribution of FRBs in this space for a forward model that we fitted to the data. And the contours show, you know, where 68% of the FRB should land, I think 90%. Um, the cosmic dispersion measure uh, is sensitive to the Hubble's parameter. You can see it explicitly in the denominator there. It's also somewhat implicitly uh, in the fact that, again, omega bh squared is known. Maybe it's one takeaway message today. If there's one number I feel confident in the universe, it's the mass density of baryons, which is Omega bh squared, such that if I actually turns out if I increase h naught, then I decrease the average dm cosmic, and that's what you're seeing here. So the highest um, h naught curve here is the red curve, and that's got the lowest 
uh, dm extragalactic values and the lowest H naught has the highest. And this gives you, so this gives you a sense if I change H naught by 10 units, which is a large in this, in this game, um, how much power you have in this plane of dm, e.g. the measurements in z. So um, with 100 FRBs, maybe I'll just stick with this. We, well, that's the real data. From 16 FRBs, um, it's not a very precise constraint. Of order 10, no, 15%, I believe. So not competitive with supernovae or the CMB. With 100 FRBs, there's optimism we can get down to of order 5%. Let's say it's 10%. Um, and, but there are degeneracies that keep me up at night that may limit just how far we go. I have a late question. So you said the source or the origin of FRBs is not known, heavily debated. And I missed it if you said this at the end, but with all of the future work planned, will it be knowable? Good, great question. Uh, I think the paths towards, I don't think any figure for me to show other than, yeah. No, we'll do that. There are a few paths towards, you know, that they're promising, phrase it that way. Um, there will be enough detected, and there already are some, that they're in our backyard. So M81 has an effort associated with it, at, which is close enough that you can now pinpoint, you know, not quite this individual star or whatever progenitor, but close. So there's optimism with many thousands to pull from. You'll have a handful where you can do that kind of detailed diagnostic studies. I'm optimistic as well. That'll happen. Not some, that's more than optimistic. Yeah, that, that is happening. That will continue to happen. And that will rule out some chance. We've already ruled, so when I started working on FRBs, AGN was a leading scenario. The first one, yeah, going into some history. The first one detected shows radio emission nearby, maybe associated with AGN. And there were many theories written that FRBs are generated by AGN process, some, some kind of interaction with an AGN. We now see that most uh, don't occur near the center of the galaxy. So that's not the leading channel. It could be a channel still. We'll start to kill a few models with that. A more optimistic, Maybe it's optimistic. Um, approach is to look for other counterparts to other wavelengths. We've been trying, we've not succeeded. So I'm not sure how optimistic it would be that we will succeed, but we'll continue trying on that. Those are two of the best avenues. Population studies matter too. As I said, none of the host galaxies are dead. So a channel that favors old, really old star populations is disfavored already. Pretty high confidence. Can take the questions online yeah, we have now. Two online. So the first one is thanks, great talk. And have there been efforts to uh, observe redshifted FRBs in multi wavelengths, or is the name suggest is it only radio admissions emissions? Uh, so we and others have tried uh, to measure FRBs at other wavelengths. Yes, the um, the most uh, well, the one that we focused on, I think others have as well. There's one FRB that repeats with enough periodicity, or something close enough to period, periodically, that you can count on it to chirp you know, every 16 days. It doesn't always, but it often does. Every six, it's a funny number, by 16 days. We don't know. Um, so we've pointed the Gemini telescope in Hawaii with its very high-speed camera, Alapeque, at it uh, to contemporaneously observe it in the optical while uh, Chime is looking at it in the radio, and we've detected, well, we've observed at the right time, but not detected any optical photon. We've also set up X-ray satellites, New Star, to try and do the same in the X-ray. Um, no success. So efforts are being made, but no counterpart. Right. And then uh, the last one I have here is, if scientists found the missing half of baryons, <laughs> what would that change cosmology? Ah, uh, it, it doesn't change cosmology. <laughs> it answers a puzzle, well, it, it's a one big step in the direction to answering this embarrassing inconsistency between our estimations of the mass, baryon mass density from early times and our direct estimation from other, you know, from counting them directly in the inner by universe. Uh, I don't think there were any of us in the community that thought we, that the two wouldn't agree at the end of the day. Um, they do. Um, so now we're trying to, we're going to the next step. Um, have to resolve that issue uh, and figure out infer 
how much of the baryons are, uh, how they're distributed within that cosmic web. To what extent are they uh, in close and around galaxies and to what extent have they been distributed on larger scales? Thank you, Jason. All right, I think we are already um, past 4.30. So if there is any pressing last question, please raise your hand quickly. If not, let's thank uh, Professor Francesca for this wonderful talk. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, please join us uh, tomorrow for his more uh, focused science talk. All right, thank you everyone. And those of you who are joining us for dinner, um, 